I guess uh, uh, a year since I uh, since this book came out. So it's uh, it's been a long time since that. Well, I've I've done some readings from this book and so on and so forth, but it's uh, it's a particular headspace to put myself in. But anyway, thank you everybody for coming. Um, my my editor Caroline is here, who I especially want to thank. She was um, instrumental in this book coming out. So thank you, Caroline. Thank you for being here a year on. Um, I'm going to start by reading a section from the middle of this novel. Um, I don't know if you know what it's about, but it's set during the last days of the civil war in my country in 2009, in I think, probably said around March or April, the war ended on the 18th of May, 2009. What mm. to say, it's a, you know, it was a dark, it was a dark time in, it was a dark time in the history of our country. Um, many, many people died. Um, one of the things I think about before I, before I, um, before I go to an event that's connected to this book is, uh, what should I wear? Usually I choose to wear darker clothes. Um, I think because it's been a while since I, since I wrote this novel, I've started to wear slightly more colorful clothes. Usually I wear very colorful clothes, but this is, this is my compromise tonight. <laughs> Dinesh moved quickly at first to the darkness of the canopy in spite of being unable to see the ground in front of him. It felt pleasant to use his legs vigorously after having sat down for so long, to feel the pressure in his feet and the strain in his calves as they lifted up the weight of his body with each step. He moved surely and without hesitation along his habitual path, and then as the trees gradually thinned and the darkness lit up, he found himself slowing down, not so much from fatigue as from a kind of nervousness about what would happen on his way through the camp. His movement became more tentative, and then finally, at the edge of the jungle, he came to a stop. The sky, immense and empty, opened up over him. The half moon was brightly visible, except for brief interludes in which walls of translucent clouds passed beneath, and it gave out a soft blue backlight that seemed wholly without source. Stretching out in front of him, each tent in the vast settlement absorbed and reflected this light, like a nighttime gathering of wraiths with nowhere to hide. The dull thudding of artillery and gunfire could be heard in the distance, but the camp itself felt cocooned in silence, as though the fighting that was raging on non-stop to the north, west, and south was a, blank, was a blanket in which the camp was swaddled rather than something that could enter and destroy it at will, without warning, many times a day. Careful not to disturb the pervasive stillness, Dinesh began walking quietly through the periphery of the camp. Most of the evacuees were inside their tents, together with their families and things, but many were sleeping out under the open sky, on the ground and in uncovered trenches, individually and in groups of up to four or five. Observing them as he passed into the more populated sections of the camp, Tinesh found himself filled slowly with the sacredness of being awake in a place in which everybody else was asleep. Those who had just fallen asleep, he could tell apart easily by their far brows and curled lips, by the effort and struggle to block out the world that was imprinted still on their faces. Their muscles were taut, their bodies curled into tight balls, their closed eyes screwed up as if to prevent anything outside them from entering in, fighting to obtain or attain a state of sleep before it was made impossible by the next shelling in a way that was not so different, perhaps, from how long ago, if he woke up earlier than necessary in the morning, he would refuse to open his eyes and stubbornly pretend to be still sleeping, despite knowing full well that soon he'd have to get up and rejoin the world. The people who had been asleep longer, in contrast, let their bodies relax and their lips droop. Their faces were peaceful and unstrained, and no longer displayed any sign of a struggle to fend off the world. Most still had their bags under their heads like pillows, or their arms and legs slung around them like teddy bears, but they were no longer clutching them like the others or even holding on to them. They seemed to have mostly lost concern with the world immediately outside them, as though their gaze had turned more or less inwards, away from their eyes and ears and hands and feet. Most of them were dreaming, their lips twitching and their eyelids flickering like Ganga's had in the clearing, their fingers and toes curling and uncurling, suspended in an uncertain realm of shifting things and obscure feelings, partly within the world still, but mostly not, while a few of them, it seemed, had managed to let go fully. Their mouths opened and their arms and legs sprawled out, the rising and falling of the chest so subtle it was hard to tell if they were still breathing, the small but increasing number had entirely ceased dreaming, it seemed. It had become lost in a deeper, more timeless sleep. It was as though these sleepers had disengaged themselves from the world entirely, from not only its objects, but also from the forms through which, in ordinary life, these objects were perceived, 
as though they had left their bodies lying unguarded in the camp and gone off to some other place, trusting meanwhile that they would be safe, though in fact, of course, shards of metal could come raining down from the sky at any time. It was these people especially, lost in this deeper, fuller sleep, that Dinesh did not want to disturb. He took care to avoid stepping too close to their heads as he moved, and looking at their calm, unknowing faces as he passed, he sensed acutely how his body slowed down beside them, how carefully his feet arched and lowered themselves onto the earth, how silently his calves tensed as they lifted his body and shifted its weight onto the next foot. No sound he made would wake them up probably, but he was fearful of disturbing the silence that surrounded their sleep all the same, wary in the same way that upon entering an empty temple one was wary of making the slightest sound, as if in a sense there was no real difference between the silence demanded by the divine and the silence demanded by the sleep of other humans. It is though, having relinquished totally the world outside them, these sleepers were in the presence now of something special, of something elusive and beautiful that had appeared or become visible inside them, and which completely ensnared them, as when one peers into the bottom of a well that is momentarily unused, in which the movement of water has, calm, has calmed and even the gentlest ripples on the surface have stilled, and looking down one can see the things that have remained silently unnoticed at the very bottom all the long years of its use. Unable to pull away, one was drawn closer and closer inside, and just as even an insect skating lightly across the water's surface might suffice to call back one's attention from the depths, make one blink and turn away, Dinesh was afraid that even the slightest movement he made might take those people lost deep in sleep away from what they had found. Walking by all the people sleeping in the camp, Dinesh wondered whether perhaps he had been mistaken to, try, to not try harder to fall asleep in these last months. Not merely because he was tired, but because perhaps in not sleeping he was missing out on something that he would not again have the chance to savor. For so many years he had tried to avoid sleep, to fend it off as yet another distraction from the central purpose of it from the central purpose of life, a purpose he could never identify, but which he waited for nevertheless with yearning, hoping it would somehow show itself in the night sky. Even when he was tired and had to be up early, he would stay up late, as if by staying up he was putting himself, he was putting himself in position to have some long-awaited experience that life would not bestow if he fell asleep. Perhaps though this attitude had been mistaken, perhaps he should have been more willing to fall asleep in the past, perhaps he should have been more sensitive to what sleep to to what sleep could give, to what it gave everybody now. When you were asleep, you always hated disturbances after all. When you were asleep, you were always happy to stay that way for the rest of your life. Even now he was refusing to, to go to bed, refusing to sleep, as if in staying awake, something would happen to justify the difficulty of having stayed awake and struggled so long. But what reward could possibly be forthcoming? What good could possibly come of being awake now? Hopefully, we'll also get some questions from the room. But um, I was maybe we'll start just with this passage since you read from it. What was your, what did you want that moment to do for the book? This moment of him walking through the camp and the stillness of the sleep of others. Um, well, you know, so the I mean, the book is about a genocide in, in my country, so. A lot of the book um, is very, very violent. A lot of the book has, um, you know, I mean, yeah, scenes of scenes of great violence. Scenes that um, when I started coming into contact with um, with like pictures and videos that started surfacing on the internet, uh, violence that I had never seen before in my life. Um, and this violence is portrayed in the book. It's portrayed especially at the beginning of the book and the end of the book. Um, but I think in writing this book, I mean, it was of course important to portray this violence, but I think it was important to me. Um, a lot of a lot of the people who were killed in this war, um, 
I mean, they're all uh, members of my community, much less privileged members of my community. People who, unlike me, did not have a chance uh, uh, either in their lifetimes or the lifetimes of their parents or grandparents to escape this part of the country. Um, uh, there are people who, um, who I, I, I think of as people who I might have been among. Um, and so it was important for me, also I guess Tamil people, um, they're very proud people, they don't like sharing, um, they don't like sharing um, uh, situations or uh, situations in which they're vulnerable, situations in which they've been wounded, um, they, um, they tend to prefer to keep silent about things that are shameful or things that are embarrassing. Um, so, so it was, I mean, on the one hand, important for me to, um, to see uh, what was, I guess, human or what was normal or what was ordinary or what was everyday about, about um, this situation, mm -hmm. to try to find ways to, uh, to uh, depict this situation um, in which the people who are being, you know, who are being subject to such violence, violence that, you know, um, rends people apart as human beings, that takes their humanity away from them, Situation in which you could, you could, you could recognize, uh, recognize them, recognize them as, as humans, mm -hmm. and in my case, as a member of my community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So sleeping is sleeping is one of those situations. Mm -hmm. It's an intimate, small, quiet part of of, of everyday life. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to portray that. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's interesting to think about the idea of relics of ordinariness in this horrific, sort of unimaginable context, right? Because Dinesh also has a collection at various points of ordinary, of, ob of ordinary objects that have been sort of taken far away from their ordinary <coughs> context, but that he kind of collects along the way of following this trail of refugees. And in a way, he, can, he has a doorknob and a button, I can't remember. I believe this. maybe a used toothbrush. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in a way, it's like there are also narrative ways of creating sort of the scenic equivalent, right? Yeah. A doorknob or a, yeah. um, a, a thing from daily life. Um, well, and on, I mean, on that note of thinking about what are the moments of a kind of a, a humanity that isn't fully defined even by this like horrific violence that it's inside of, um, I'm wondering why, what drew you to the particular narrative framework kind of within your novel, as the title suggests, the one of the central narrative threads is this um, marriage um, that happens between two people and what felt compelling about using that narrative of, of a marriage inside of this yeah. war. Um, uh, I guess, so I mean, just to explain, I guess, the kind of narrative structure, I mean, this was a thing that happened a lot in Sri Lanka, um, actually in 1995 or 1996 at a specific point when um, when people were uh, under people formerly under rebel control were suddenly um, uh, under the control of, of government soldiers, um, a lot of parents were afraid because there's a lot of sexual violence against uh, against young women, but also oftentimes against against young men. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of rape um, as a form of torture, as a form of kind of psychological um, uh, control. So a lot of parents uh, fearing that their daughters would be raped when um, when the areas in which they lived came under government control would um, would try to kind of marry their marry their daughters to strangers, um, hoping I guess that I mean this kind of superstitious kind of magical thinking uh, that if their daughters were married then maybe soldiers on the government side would be more likely to pass them over for for other people, which uh, was emphatically. Uh, not the case, obviously. Um, but I, yeah, so I, I read about this story. Um, I'm also very, I'm, I'm also not very good at, uh, I guess, coming up with stories or coming up with things that um, could interest people. I think so. When I read it, <laughs> it, it 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 struck me as a, you know, okay, so this is this is what's going to happen, or this is this is the story of the narrative. Um, uh, that can structure all of the other uh, non-stories mm -hmm. that I wanted to, mm -hmm. um, all of the other moments of silence, all of the other mm -hmm. moments that are not leading to anything in the future, but mm -hmm. are simply about, uh, about being in the present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like the idea of trying to 
seek out the narrative structure that can permit all the moments of non-story that you want to smuggle in, like yeah. a kind of Trojan horse or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, and I, I mean, I, I, I wonder, there's this quote that I love to hear, it's from, um, from an interview I read um, that connects to me to that question, so I'm just going to embarrass you by no, okay. reading it and then <laughs> ask you something about it. But I've done so much research for this. <laughs> I'm prepared. Um, uh, you said, in everything I write, I think of the elements of the external world, people, places, histories, situations, events, as a kind of anchor that allows me to get close to the elements of inner life that most interest me. The external world, at least when I am writing, is like an anchored boat from which a diver enters the water, confident that however far or deep she dives, there will be a reference point on the surface to which she can safely return. Um, and I was thinking about that quote when you were talking about the like, narrative as a structure that would allow you to do certain kinds of, get to certain moments of silence um, that you wanted to get to. Um, but I'm interested in that idea of um, the external world as something that lets you get close to the elements of, of inner life that compel you. And, and I was curious, you know, it's like an easy way to talk about this book is in terms of its external events and the external events that it's making reference to. But I'm interested in what those external events were an occasion for, like what were the parts of inner life that you felt you were compelled to explore in this book or through this set of externals? Mm. I don't know, it's difficult to say. Um, I think certain ways of I don't know, I mean, when you, the description you give, um, the thing that comes to mind is now a scene that I'm writing um, in, a, in a new piece of, in a new piece of, uh, of, of fiction, which is very different, um, which describes, um, there's a specific scene which describes two people um, uh, who are making their way home in, uh, on the metro, in, on, the, on the subway in New Delhi, um, and they're fairly intoxicated, and it's the first time they've met each other. Uh, and they both clearly want to uh, sleep together and uh, they're trying to speak or they're trying to find ways to communicate with each other but it, 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 it's very clear that in such a moment I mean this is a situation, this is flirtation it, it's such a, it, it's, it's so obvious that um, what's being said or it's not, what's being said doesn't matter so much rather mm -hmm. The fact of speech is a way, is a, is a kind of vehicle that allows for certain moments of uh, recognition, um, mm -hmm. I guess in terms of eye contact, certain moments of one person moving their body this way, the other person moving their body this way, um, that in this particular context, for example, speech is just, speech is just, uh, speech is just something that allows other things to happen. Uh, that would not be able to happen mm -hmm. if speech was not occurring. Mm -hmm. Speech is kind of almost in this particular situation a kind of um, it's a screen that allows people to communicate different things between each other. That if they were communicating directly, or if they didn't have a screen, would be um, would be too difficult. Would be um, would be um, almost too direct. Mm -hmm. uh, they would have to bear themselves up too completely. Mm -hmm. um, so in a way, that's how I think a little bit about also mm -hmm. the role of, of, of narrative or like things happening in the text. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, I don't know, it's a little difficult to simply, um, whatever happens that's important, I feel, happens while other things are going on. Mm -hmm. um, and even in the portrayal of, of what's important, um, one needs to have other things going on in a way because, yes, yeah, it's somehow too. Um, uh, things are otherwise too, uh, almost too direct, too bare, too a little bit too, um, uh, a little bit. Um, I don't know how to be. There are certain writers that I like to read that are. I don't know. I just I I I, um, I distinguish the writers I like in terms of writers who have the quality of patience and writers who have the quality of impatience. Um, Writers who have the quality of patience uh, are writers. Think of like Zebal, uh, especially in this in this context. Writers who, who I guess, kind of they know. 
they know what they want to say, but they, uh, but they're extremely patient in going about it so that they can approach um, they can approach what they want to communicate completely. They can circle around it. They can be slow about it. And then there are other writers. Um, Clarice Lispector is, uh, is kind of paradigmatic in my mind of uh, this kind of writer. There's a kind of impatience. They're too, they can't, um, you almost feel that they can't, they can't be bothered with, with all this artifice, with like one person, one person saying another thing, setting up a scene, setting up a context, who cares if it's snowing, if it's summer, if it's, you know, like, it's like, it's besides the point. It, it doesn't get to the bottom of, of uh, and, I, and I feel a, a very close opinion to these kinds of writers. Um, Natalie Sarot is another one, Robert Mozil, um, because I also often feel impatient in my writing. Uh, but then they're very, they're, they're much more like unbearable to read. <laughs> um, so, so I, I, I try to like balance my impatience with, with this kind, with a kind of cultivated patience. Yeah, yeah. Well, as you were like, as you were setting up those categories, wondering whether you felt yourself more aligned with one or the other, because I think when I think about your novel, I I would describe it as a as a patient novel, both in terms of how it narrates, but also I think in terms of what it asks of a, a reader, not, not that it asks a, a reader to be patient in a bad way, but that it asks the reader to pay attention to experience in a very kind of dilated way, um, which was part of what I loved in it and found to be not what I was used to reading in a great way, you know, and, and to be concrete about it, it's like to spend pages engaged in tasks of physical existence, to prepare rice, to go shit on the beach, to, you know, I mean, these very embodied things, but also things where so much truth comes up when you let the narrative stay with those tasks for a little while, rather than summarizing them in a sentence. Um, so I, I, you've cultivated the patience well, if it's been something you've been interested in cultivating, but um, I'm also, I mean, I'm curious to hear you speak a bit to that, um, to that mode of narration, to sort of both in terms of the kind of <coughs> focus on life as something lived by a, a body um, and the kind of physicality of your narrative and also that idea of paying kind of close attention to quieter aspects of experience or undramatic moments. Um, well, you know, the focus on the body was, I think, somewhat specific to this particular text yeah. because it's not something that I think has uh, come up to the degree it has come up um, in this book in my present writings. Um, and that's just because, you know, I guess this book is about, um, it's about people in very different circumstances than my own. Um, I remember there was a particular picture that I saw um, when I was looking at pictures um, from, of, of this kind of, of this kind of thing, which I now no longer do, um, which is also part of the reason that I can wear more colorful clothes, um, of of a young man um, from the from the Tamil Tigers uh, who had been caught by soldiers by the by government soldiers, and he had been he had been tied to um, to a coconut tree or banana tree. His arms were um, his arms were tied uh, behind his back. And um, there were before there were about five or six pictures taken at different um, taken at different um, points in time. The last uh, featuring him uh, lifeless, and the first featuring him uh, unwounded but uh, deadly afraid. Um, uh, and he was killed by he was killed in the, over the course of the pictures by um, by various woundings by night. But this particular person um, he must have been about 22, 23 in this. In this picture, he looked just like uh, my second cousin, who's from the north of Sri Lanka, um, and physically just looked just like him, uh, kind of tall, lanky. Um, and I also saw myself in in this person, and uh, yeah, it was very much a physical like uh, response that I had to these images, in the sense that okay, this is my body, or this could just as well be my body in this situation. Um, that was kind of part of the like very visceral um, <coughs> reason that there's so much description of physical physical events, sleeping, um, sex or attempted sex, um, uh, shitting as you say, um, 
and this kind of thing. Um, I forget the second, you, you wanted me to, there was something else you wanted to talk about that I felt that I had an interesting answer to. <laughs> 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 but I forget the... Uh, I know, I should just give you one question. Yeah. Well, part of it was just, yeah, about the bias thing. Yeah. What can be found in those quieter moments? I mean, it's connected to what you were saying earlier about yeah. smuggling in the yeah. moments of non yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm like I'm writing now something which requires this um, same quality of patience that I felt that I was um, that I was able to summon uh, when I was writing this book, but um, but I find it's much more difficult to summon now. Uh, I think it has to do with. Uh, I don't know differences in my in my in my in my life situation. Um, I think when I wrote this book, I was very um, uh, things were fairly stable in a way in my life, um, and I find that when things are stable in my life, I uh, um, I'm always dissatisfied. I'm really like unhappy with with how things are. But when I'm when things are stable, the the, the expression of this dissatisfaction. Uh, it doesn't take the form of concrete action. It takes the form of um, looking into like looking into distances, looking into horizons, looking into the sky, um, and so on, so on and so forth. It it takes the expression of a certain kind of uh, what I would call yearning, uh, like um, a sense of lacking something but um, not knowing what it is that could could satisfy that um, that lack. And so, um, and so you're not actually actively pursuing any kind of thing, as opposed to when you desire something. Mm -hmm. um, uh, these days, I'm. These days, I yeah, I guess I lack that sense of yearning, and so uh, finding this particular space of quietness. Uh, yeah, it, it's very much a practical project. It's mm -hmm. it, you know, I'm, I I chose to write this book that I'm writing now in order to in order to create this kind of uh, this kind of quietness that I mm -hmm. that I don't have but that I that I appreciate and that I that I wish for. And how do you how how do you find it? I mean what are your is is there there is there a concrete answer to that question or is it a more concrete like, answer to which question? How you find that space of um quiet that you're sort uh, of personal asking there. really personal <laughs> <laughs> takes the form of like various rituals, mm -hmm. so certain kinds of uh, rituals of quietness. Um, uh, one of my, uh, actually I, I always start this anecdote by saying one of my favorite writers, I actually really don't like this writer, his name is um, Ake Narayan, he's an he's a English language um, writer from, from, from South India, from Tamil Nadu, who I think he passed away some time ago, but uh, there is an interview in which he does make an insightful comment. Um, and uh, the, the insightful comment is that he talks about writing as a kind of yoga uh, in the technical sense of a yoga as a kind of uh, any kind of uh, like uh, disciplined activity, any kind of rule governed activity that you're supposed to engage with on a daily basis and that is supposed to um, over, a, over a period of time lead you closer and closer to some kind of enlightenment. He talk, so he talks about um, about writing as an activity along these lines, and so uh, yeah, so so I, I view I view writing and writing in particular about this form of quiet as a way of also uh, attempting to attain. It, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you a couple more. I could ask you questions all night. I'm yeah. gonna ask you a couple more, and then maybe I'm sure there are a lot of questions also for men here, Myers in the room. Um, but I'm I'm wondering two things that I'll let myself ask for now. But um, one is about sort of um, how the experience of surprise functions for you when you write um, and. And I, I'm curious, just in light of what you just said, how sort of spaces of quiet and surprise might work together. But it, with this book, what were the ways that it surprised you? I mean, how did it, and whether that took the form of um, something on the level of character or dynamics between characters, or whether it took the form of a kind of um, formal surprise or something about the structure of the book not unfurling like you thought, or you know, were there ways in which it, it Pushed back against your expectations for what it might be. Um, 
No, I don't, I don't think there was any surprise in this. I mean, are you talking about like within the, the narrative structure itself or just in terms of the writing process and how it was? Both. 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 Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the title says, right, it's called The Story of a Brief Marriage because, and so you know this, that the marriage is brief and you know, therefore, that the novel will be about the ending of this marriage. Um, so there's no, I mean, this, the element of surprise is, the surprise is removed. Um, and that was because, well, it's also because me coming across this material, um, uh, coming, you know, learning about this genocide shortly after it happened, everybody's already dead, everything has already happened. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, it's an event that there's no moving, no, 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 no recovering from for the people who've gone mm -hmm. through it. Uh, so, so as a writer, how could there be surprise? Everything is already ruined, everything is already gone. Mm -hmm. So um, it would feel dishonest to, it was just the condition of, of me as a writer writing this, you know. Um, okay, this whole thing happened, there I was living my, um, my frivolous life um, in a foreign country, um, uh, and, and then it was over. Um, and I found out about everything, you know, it was, every, everything happened, uh, started and finished without my knowledge. The, I mean, talking about the last couple of years of this mm -hmm. whole, uh, and so I wanted to convey this sense of when you feel surprised, you feel surprised because you feel that there is a sense because you feel that something else might have happened, right? Mm -hmm. You're surprised because you expected it to go one way, it happened this way. There was a possibility. There were possibilities. Things were open, but in this case, there was nothing. There, there were no possibilities mm -hmm. in terms of my epistemological kind of state. Yeah. It, no, this was this is how it this is yes. how it will be for these people. Um, and then in terms of uh, the book itself and how it turned out, I don't think I really felt much surprise. Um, I don't know. I've been, I was thinking about this actually um, this afternoon or maybe yesterday, but um, things happened that um, that seem surprising at the time, but then they're very very quickly assimilated, um, and everything you do is immediately. Um, immediately is oriented around the new fact, and the new fact um, becomes, um, the, the, the initially surprising fact becomes a kind of, um, like a kind of foundational stone around which your mental, your subsequent mental life is built. And so looking back on the surprising fact, it, it very quickly um, ceases to have this quality of, of being surprising, right? Um, and I think I, I think I also just assimilate maybe, uh, uh, certain new and surprising things quickly. Mm -hmm. So, um, so look. So I don't know. Maybe things were surprising as I was writing it. But. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's certainly true that um, I mean, I think sometimes surprise can work both ways. That either the the fact of surprise becomes part of the story you tell yourself about how something unfolded, or as you say, it becomes sort of normalized into mm -hmm. the the story of how things always were. And um, I mean, one of the things I felt experientially as I read this book was that there's as you say, the title suggests a narrative that's not about um, how things turn out because it tells you how things turn out, but that this kind of, this mode of attention that we've been talking about to the sort of nuances and smaller moments of what might happen in a person or what might happen between two people actually created a sort of opportunity um, to be in a space of unknowing about mm -hmm. what would happen. Like, I knew it would be a brief marriage, but I didn't know what was going to happen at this particular moment on the sleeping rock where Dinesh is wondering how will she respond if I move my body in just such a way, right? And I didn't yeah. know how she would respond either. And so it's sort of, it's like almost like you have this large framework of, of knowing or predetermined event and then within that there's still this element right. of what, what will transpire between these two consciousnesses in this moment. Like a, Yeah, now that you mention it, yeah, that was a moment. I was not sure how um, the, the, the new husband, the new wife, um, uh, there's a moment of sexual tension between them. And, and, yeah, I also was not sure how that would end. Yeah. Was, <laughs> how that would end. Um, what, uh, let's maybe we open it up to. Yeah, I don't know what the time situation is. I have no idea either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what the I mean, this is, you only mentioned Jaffna once in this book. Um, 
but it is of a time um, so I'm wondering whether what the reception has been in Sri Lanka and uh, you you write in Tamil as well whether you've translated into Tamil whether you have any intentions and more to the point in my case have you decided thought about translating it into Sinhala? Mm -hmm. um. Reception in Sri Lanka has been, um, because Sri Lanka officially doesn't recognize that there is uh, mm -hmm. a genocide in it. Um, in fact, the, uh, the, uh, the various um, uh, military uh, maneuvers that led to the death of 40,000 civilians in the north uh, is often described by the government as a rescue, op a rescue operation. Um, uh, but well, this is a book in English, uh, so you know the kinds of uh, the kinds of people. I'm sure well enough who would come across this book who would hear about it. Uh, people who live in a bubble, people who are not really um, uh, who don't uh, maybe uh, uh, live outside who, who don't live outside a very particular Sri Lanka. So these people are very you know they're very congratulatory. They're like ah okay, a Sri Lankan writer has written this. Uh, uh, but it, it, it makes no kind of impact, of course, outside this uh, highly sterile, this highly sterile sphere. Um, and within this sphere, um, I don't know. This novel doesn't have many political opinions, but uh, but if it if it did have have explicit political opinions, I'm sure also this sphere would 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 cease to, would cease to be as happy about its publication as they seem to be. Um, uh, I don't want to publish, I don't want to translate it into Singhali. Well, I mean, I wouldn't translate it into Singhali because I can't read and write Singhali. But, but people have asked me would I translate it into Tamil, uh, which I also don't want to do, simply because I don't want to uh, dwell, on this, dwell on this subject for very much longer. I don't want to continue to dwell on it. Um, and also, in general, you know, people are like, okay, let's translate into Singhali, let's translate into Tamil. Uh, it's been, I don't believe really that literature has much political potential, uh, not this kind of literature. I don't believe anything will change out of its publications. So, um, uh, so if somebody wants to translate it, then, yeah, they're, they're more than welcome. But I won't stop them. Can I have a follow-up? Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, I was very interested in the way you portray Dinesh, um, but more interested actually as to where you got your inspiration for Ganga. Because she seems to have got the memo that this is this is doomed. And he goes through a process of actually hoping that somehow it yeah. that there would be some something that can be salvaged. Yeah. I mean the bath and all of that is part of that. Yes. Uh, yes. But could you talk a little bit of how she, how you came upon her? You know, I don't I don't really know, but my sense is that from you know just like um, things that I've come across, people or like materials, is that um, uh, the the men um, seem to have dealt with this situation in a in a much more foolish way than the women. Like in terms psychologically, they seem to have been able to uh, in, many, in many cases less able to deal with. Uh, certain facts, things that are happening with um, with the kind of emasculation that uh, that that war brings, um, and often um, also this is a society that's been fighting uh, in war for thirty years, right? So for thirty years, women have been assuming various kinds of uh, roles that maybe traditionally they might not have assumed. Uh, so they, um, I don't, I mean, so they are cooking, they are providing. Uh, uh, they're providing a living for their family, they are looking after um, uh, people who have been wounded, people who are disabled. Um, uh, they have had to like deal with the facts uh, in, in practical, uh, urgent ways that um, that men, a lot of men seem not, seem not to have been able to deal with. Um, and so I think like uh, Ganga, for example, her um, uh, I guess I kind of know her, 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 like her lack of kind of hope or her lack of um, her sense of reality. Um, I don't know. It was it was something that I 
it was something that I had come across in, in a few people that I had, that I had met, people who, uh, people who uh, women, like a couple of women that I remember, who did not seem to have, uh, simply did not seem to have time or energy for, um, for, uh, for um, flights of thought, for like, for like romanticizations, for hopes, for, um, for, um, uh, for sentiment of various kinds. They just seem, just, they added, I felt a couple of people that I came across were simply that uh, there's no time for this. We have other things to do. Uh, uh, I think part of Ganga's character was kind of was based on that, was shaped on, yeah, on that. I want to ask you about a um, comment you just made about uh, literature not having kind of that kind of political impact. Are you not feeling that it has that kind of political impact? Um, which is an idea that I'm personally inclined to agree with, but it's quite starkly different from what I think most of the, you could say, like American cosmopolitan intelligentsia, broadly speaking, thinks about art. Like it's, it's very, very starkly different opinion on it. So I'd just like to hear you say, a little more about it, and a little more about the idea that one could use art in that way for literature. Um, I don't know. The I mean, this group that you mentioned is is notorious for its for being far, far removed from certain kinds of facts of the world, right? I I don't know. Um, uh, you want me to say more about uh, how I think it could have some kind of potential? Um, no, I, I want you to just explain more why it doesn't. I'm asking you to um, indicate my intuition. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> I mean, in this case, it's very, con it's very, it's very, um, it's very, uh, it's very concrete, right? I mean, uh, medicine doesn't have the power to bring back the dead, so why should literature? So it simply doesn't. It doesn't have the power to do what it wants to do, or to do what its creator wants it to do. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, other. Um, Less significant forms of uh, uh, political action. Uh, let's see, in Sri Lanka, I mean, a lot of like political action centering around um, from the Tamil side, centering around this war was uh, has to do with uh, war crimes and um, uh, having trials, having courts, um, setting up courts, uh, finding people responsible, um, uh, sending them to the Hague, and so on and so forth. Um, I don't know, I mean, you know, it's not that I believe it can't happen, but I'm skeptical because these institutions, you know, have their own agendas, they, they, why should they bother with Sri Lanka? I don't know. So the particular forms of political action, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if people even read books. I don't know how many people are going to read <laughs> I mean, not many people are going to read this book. And, you know, 100,000 people read this book. I can promise you it's 100,000 people who, uh, whose idea of political significant, political action is so far removed from reality that it would not lead to any kind of political change whatsoever. So why did you write it? Why did you become a lawyer? Uh, why did I what? Why did you write it? Mm. Um, I, it was just my way of, um, uh, you know, um, my way of, um, Trying to understand an event that was important to me, my my way of uh, dealing with uh, something that had a kind of psychic effect on me, and I know that it had a psychic effect on a lot of other Tamils like me who are, who lived in Colombo or lived in Toronto or London or in, in various European cities where they moved as refugees or as immigrants. Um, a lot of people. Um, uh, more privileged or lucky or whatever members of my community. Um, and, to, and to deal with the fact that this was happening and there was nothing that they could do. Um, and everybody found different ways of dealing with it. Um, mine was to write this book. But I mean, that's how I think about it. It, it was simply uh, it was simply my response to it. Did you feel that there was nothing that they could do or what they were contributing wasn't helpful? Who? You're talking about the time of diaspora. I'm just like, that's not. So this is my mother and my father who's not here, he's not old. Okay, so as a member of the time of diaspora. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I'm single. Okay, yeah, my okay, okay. Um, yeah, and it seems like what you're saying is that 
idea, like a lot of this is empathy grounded in the water, right? In the very, like to put yourself there, you have to imagine what it is to live in, right? Um, so is this kind of, like beyond your reflection, is it kind of archival or? Oh, archival. Um, there's a lot of archival. I mean, there's um, there's a couple of psychiatrists in the north who have mm -hmm. who have produced extensive like Thais Omasundaram. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's produced some really good uh, 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 papers with like a lot of testimony. There was in South India a lot of um, uh, TV stations that interviewed survivors, uh, and there's a lot of footage on YouTube actually. Mm -hmm. uh, there are various people who have various um, photographs on on Flickr, like lots of <laughs> lots of. I don't know if that counts as archive, but a lot of there's a lot of material that records what hap uh, that has recorded what what happens. So um, I was not, of course, there. I didn't experience this. So this is, uh, I mean, it's a kind of imaginary archive, if you want. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't really have any opinions about the about the diaspora, which is a very dairy group, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I do wish that um, a lot of the people who uh, who um, Send money for the war effort, for the Tamil Tiger war effort, um, had uh, continued to uh, spend money. I mean, a lot of the people who spend money on the on the on the Tamil Tigers who give money to the Tamil Tigers have, um, if they're spending money in Sri Lanka now, it's to it's to it's to like build temples basically, mm -hmm. other dumb stuff like that. Uh, so I wish they maybe uh, use their money in, in as active and considered and considered and systematic a way. Yeah. Uh, uh, but they don't. Um, so I don't know. Maybe now that they, maybe now that there's no possibility for a new country in Sri Lanka, um, they're spending their money um, trying to actually build lives in the places where they live. I don't know. I don't know. I can ask. I can answer a cheerful question. I, can. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask. Can we talk about this a little bit? Um, about a year ago, I asked them to come to speak to my class at Columbia because I was teaching this book, um, and it was a class focused on writing about the body, and we talked about some of the things that we talked about here. But at that point, we talked a little bit about um, your practice of writing in Tamil um, and what it meant to you, and I, I would be curious both to hear you speak a little bit more to that, and also just how, if, if and how it's evolved as you've been also working on this new project. And, well, I wasn't uh, I wasn't educated in Tamil. I was educated. I studied for uh, two years in Tamil when I was a kid, uh, but I had to basically learn how to read and write from scratch maybe about uh, eight or nine years ago. Um, uh, and it's it's very important to me, and it's very important that um, that I that I write in Tamil. I don't know because it feels. Obviously, you can't make money learning writing in Tamil, um, and obviously, um, writers who write in Tamil, contemporary Sri Lankan writers, would uh, love to obtain the kind of audience that, uh, if you make it, if you get published by um, by a by a prominent publishing house uh, in the English language, they would love the kind of recognition and the kind of you know uh, all of the various things that come with that. Um, uh, so it's 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 obviously a decision that I that I have made uh, that comes from a certain kind of privilege, not to have to worry about those things. Uh, but it's yeah I don't know it's very it's very important to me because because I view I view the, the whole the whole question I mean also Tamil how 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 the how the how the desire the articulation for a separate state in Sri Lanka Tamil state was very often. Um, Put in terms of language, right? We want a place where the Tamil language can flourish, where the Tamil language can be safe. But I also think of, say, the genocide in Sri Lanka, along with various other um, uh, mass atrocities in South Asia um, in the in the late twentieth century, um, or the mid twentieth century, the partition, um, uh, the, the the war in Bangladesh, mm -hmm. the Naxalites in India, um, all of these. I mean, all of these these violent. Um, uh, these violent events that caused the deaths of many, many people can be very much traced back to to the British um, and to certain kinds of structures implemented by the British in, in the subcontinent over 200 years of rule. Um, the same structures that lead me to, 
to speak English so comfortably. <coughs> um, the same structures that were responsible for um, the distract. I mean, so for example, we have the Center for Fiction here. So as you see, it's a beautiful institution with many lovely books and busts and so on and so forth. One of many institutions in this in this city, uh, around this country, in Europe, in the UK, in Australia, that is dedicated, that has uh, funds coming in yearly to it. Uh, and I'm sure you have to you struggle for funds in this institution too, but. Uh, the English language has so many institutions and so much money and so many things just there to, to support it, to ensure its flourishing. Uh, we also had institutions, I'm sure, I mean, more modest institutions, um, but they were completely destroyed uh, by, by colonization, by the colonization of the British and then post-1948 by the colonization of the Sri Lankan government, uh, the Sri Lankan state in the north of the country. So. All of the institutions that are necessary for the production of a, lit of a literature and the production of a literary community uh, have been gone, have been, have been destroyed. So, uh, you know, again, I don't believe it's going to make any small change, but it, in my mind it seems like uh, uh, it's an important thing to do for me mm -hmm. to, to, in some way, uh, and maybe if I you know, win a prize or something or make some money, uh, to, you know, to maybe like, create a small institution mm -hmm. that will in some way uh, ensure, if not the flourishing, then at least the continuation of of, uh, of, of, uh, of our literature. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and the experience of writing itself, like, are you, uh, how is your writing, or is it different when you write in Samuel than English, and do you feel like you're accessing a different part of your creative self or a different set of creative impulses? Well, my written time is also, it's very basic in the sense that um, at, at this moment I've written I would the, the the most ambitious I would be is to write small essays. You know, mainly it's in my journal. Um, I enjoy writing Tamil a lot more when I'm in America, mm -hmm. because also part of the reason that I, I like to write is to remove myself from the the space I'm in, from the from my present environment. So in fact, when I'm in when I'm in Sri Lanka, if I'm in North of Sri Lanka, I do prefer to write in, in English because mm -hmm. I'm always speaking Tamil. Mm -hmm. So it's a way for me to distance myself from that local. So here I do like writing. Uh, I, I do like writing things in Tamil because because it's a way of it's a way of pretending I'm not here, which is what I like to do wherever. Where, where, where. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so just like yeah. <laughs> uh, can well, we ask this one question? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, go on. Just one question. That's for like, a cheery question. You mentioned uh, a scene like a New Delhi like train. Yeah. So, what are some new things that you're writing right now? I don't know if this is a cheery question, but like, just ah, like, uh, well, kind of in the future. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I thought I would write something that was a little bit more cheerful, so I so I decided I would write a novel about masturbation. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that was my plan. And, uh, uh, but um, yeah, as I sometimes say. It's, it's funny how dark masturbation can become <laughs> uh, when you've just been thinking about all this other stuff. So, you know, it's, it's a mix. It's, it's a mix. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>